In this video, I'm going to demo McLaw Software Solutions text alignment tool. We designed this tool so that a human aligner could match words in one text with words in a parallel text. Now we had several main design goals as we engineered the software tool. In particular, we wanted the human aligner to be able to produce a text alignment with a very high degree of quality and where alignment decisions would be made in a very consistent manner yet the aligner could also work with great speed. In this case we're looking at the Hebrew Bible and its English translation in the English Standard Version or ESV. And the verse that is in view right now is Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 as we see here at the top of the screen. Now one of the main ways that we set out to help the aligner work with quality, consistency, and speed was in the presentation of the alignment data itself. You will notice that each Hebrew word appears vertically, uh, one word per row in this kind of vertical presentation. Sometimes Hebrew words are broken into multiple parts because they have two separate parts that can be broken apart in that way. English words, however, appear one word per row in all cases. So that if we read it from top to bottom, it's possible to make sense of the text. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, etc. Now this vertical presentation allows us to maintain the word order of both the source text and the target text and present rather a large amount of text on a single screen. But we've done several other things to help a human aligner visualize the alignment that is being produced. What probably stands out to you is the colors and lines that you see. So if we look up here at the top, we'll see that Achar and After are paired by this horizontal line, and they're both colored this dark blue color. And on the next row, we see Had Devarim. These two words together are colored red. And we have lines, red lines, going across to things. But there's a third thing that we have uh, implemented in this tool to assist with this visualization as well, and it's, it's blank spaces. So if we come down here to Devar Adonai, we'll notice that there are two words in Hebrew, but the corresponding English words are five, the word of and the Lord. Now because there are more English words than Hebrew words, blank spaces have been inserted at this point to keep things as horizontal as possible. Now there's an algorithm always running such that when changes are made to the text alignment, it tries to maximize the number of horizontal lines and, and sort of bring diagonal lines as close together as possible. Um, like here we have you know, these crossing lines right here. You'll notice that there are other horizontal lines across the screen. Now if we, if we change the alignment, as I'm talking about, we'll see things jump around uh, kind of immediately. So let's go ahead and, and re-link those two bits. Now in addition to this nice visualization that really makes it easy for a human to understand what goes with what, there are other pieces of critical information that are presented to the human aligner to help with judgments as to what should go with what, or what the Hebrew means. So far we've only been looking at the surface form here at Onai, but we see next to it in this column a lemma. This is the lexical form of the word. In the column to the left of that, we have morphology codes that tell us key information about the way that this word um, functions in its phrase, clause, or sentence. To the left of that, we have contextual yet literal glosses. So if we look up here, we see word of, which has been chosen for this particular occurrence of the word word. And you'll see that it matches fairly closely the English translation, the word of. Now with these three pieces of information, sort of lexical information about the Hebrew word, grammatical information, as well as a contextual literal gloss, it's very easy for the human aligner to get at what the Hebrew word um, and neighboring words mean. But there's also some really cool information here to the left. It's called previous links. Now here we have, presented in order of descending frequency, the most common English words that this Hebrew word is linked to. So word is actually the most common, as is the 
the translation that's given at Genesis 15, 1 here. But after that thing, act, matter, say, dot, 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 um, there's not enough space to show the rest of this list. This gives a very good sense of other possible interpretations, likely interpretations, um, of this word based on its alignment in other contexts. Now to give you a sense of what it's like for the human aligner to, to match things, let's jump to Genesis 16.1. And the way that I navigate to a new passage is by using uh, the controls that are up here. I can type into this box, hit go, and it pulls up Genesis 16.1. And I want to look at the second half of this verse that in English reads, she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And I'm going to unalign, unlink all of the pieces of English in, in Hebrew. And this is kind of a drag and drop interface. I'm clicking and dragging while I'm, while I'm holding down my click towards the center, then I release and the alignment um, is, is erased, so to speak. It's also possible to use uh, a touch screen interface. Uh, right now I'm using my mouse, but I have an all-in-one display and I can use my finger. In fact, I'll just do that right now and remove links as well. So what's it like to actually try to match these Hebrew and English tokens one with another? Well, let's do that. So in Hebrew, we see Vela Shifcha Mitrit, which very literally says, and for her slave Egyptian. So there's nothing in English that corresponds to and or but or anything like that. There's no conjunction introducing the English sentence, so we'll, we'll leave that unaligned. We have for her. Well, the idea of possession is best conveyed by the English had, even though we're dealing with kind of a preposition and a verb in the two languages. For her, her corresponds to she. That is Sarai. Now, Shifcha is servant, so we'll link those. Mitzrit means Egyptian. Oh, we forgot about a uh, and female. Well, these ideas go with the word servant. But servant is the most basic, sort of lexically, of what the Hebrew word Shifcha means. So I'm going to double click there, which gives um, primary status to this English word in, in the, the group of words a female servant. And it, you'll see that it bolds the text when I do that. Primary status in this tool can be assigned to any word on, on English or Hebrew side in a group of words that's linked. Now the second clause here says, U Shema Hagar. Now U it also means and, just like we had above, and it's not exactly clear where that should go with, so I'm going to skip it for now. Shame, however, is very clear. It means name, so that should be linked. Similarly, this third feminine singular suffix on the word shame, which has no surface form you'll see here. It only has a lexical form. Uh, it's not clear what to do with that. We're going to skip it, but we know that we should match Hagar with Hagar. Now, the English word whose is like the Hebrew conjunction vav syntactically in that relative pronouns introduce clauses just like conjunctions. So syntactically, we could see that we might want to link vav u with, with whose here. However, one might also make an argument that this third feminine singular suffix, which is pronominal, should go with a relative pronoun for more of a morphological, grammatical um, reason. Or, it might be the case we want to actually group the two Hebrew tokens and match them with, with the English word whose. Now, I, I kind of wonder, like, what is the best decision to, to take in this place? Um, it's not necessarily a matter of what is right or wrong, but there are surely other examples like this in the large corpus of the Hebrew Bible, and we want to be consistent in the way that we do them from sort of one case to another. So the way that I can dive deeper into this tool um, is by double-clicking anywhere on this row for Vav, and you'll see all of a sudden all 50,520 occurrences of the Hebrew word Vav have been pulled up, um, giving me information about what they correspond to in the English translation. So you'll see that and is showing up quite a few times. Now in this table, I'll give you a brief rundown of what, what information is being presented. We have each occurrence shown in this table, um, and they're ordered canonically. So Genesis 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, etc. 
Then we have morphological information about each occurrence. And you see when I click on these at the top, um, these headers, I can, I can sort them by each column. Now group tells me whether this word occurs in a group or not, so let's kind of scroll down until we find one. Like right here, Vav is, is joined with Gom. If this checkbox is checked, then this next column tells me what other lemmas it's paired with, and if any of them is primary. That's what this column tells me. Now finally, I have similar information about the English words. English lexeme, all of them that are, that are linked. The primary, if there's a group. So let's see if we can go and find a, here we go. Um, and if is, is paired with Vav, and it's got a checkbox, and neither and nor if is given primary status here. So the question that we had, why we pulled up this tool, was should we link Vav with whose, Vav and the third feminine singular suffix together with whose, or just the suffix? And to answer this question, I'm going to sort all of this data by linked primary lexeme. And the A's, lots of ands, are at the top. Let's go down towards the W's to see if we can find whose. Oh, there it is. And we'll see, oh yes, elsewhere I have linked Vav with whose, so that's probably what we want to do here. So I'm going to remove this 3FS and we'll see that the table over here automatically updates. Now it's, it's possible to use this um, aggregate data in this panel on the left as one works through the text itself, but it's also possible to use it in kind of a post-processing format. Now if I click up here on source overview, I'm presented with another table that shows me all of the Hebrew and Aramaic uh, lexemes that occur in the corpus. And I can sort and filter these in various ways. Now I want to look for the Hebrew verb karat. And I can filter it here. Now we get several entries for karat, all a verb. This is because this verb, this root, occurs in multiple stems and we're considering those basically separate verbs. Now this one right here that occurs 73 times with uh, English primary lemmas as cut, perish, consume, etc. This is the nephal. I double click on that and pull up a table of nephal occurrences. And I can double check that these are in fact nephal because the morphology codes all read you know, VN verb in the nephal. Now say I want to check you know, to be, see that, how consistent I've been in aligning the Hebrew and English lemmas in the case of karat in the nephal. It's sort by linked lexemes. And, um, actually, I want to sort by linked lexemes, but first uh, have them sorted by linked primary lexeme. When I do that, I see cut occurs very, very frequently. Um, and I can sort of do a second look of groups within cut if I, if I do this kind of double sort. At the top, we see be cut off, be cut off, be cut off, it be cut down, it be cut off, may be cut off, shall be cut. That one stands off, stands out a little bit to me because there's nothing sort of going with cut. And as I go down, like shall be cut off, I wonder is something sort of weird, something weird going on here. I can double click on it and it pulls up back in the right panel um, this occurrence in context and highlights it in yellow. And I see shall all flesh be cut, uh, oh look, off was not aligned in any way. And I probably meant to have it like this. Um, with off included. And if I come back over and click, it automatically updates. And perhaps that's the same thing going on here. Let's check. Shall be cut off. Aha, that should have been should have been uh, grouped with that verb phrase there. It's also possible to do post-processing in another way um, in this tool. So if I click on checkers, it brings up you know the current verse I'm in. It's going to check all the verses from Genesis 17:14 to Genesis 17:14 inclusive. I click on check and some flags get thrown. We have a bunch of different checkers that look for different kinds of uh, possible mistakes. The first thing that shows up is a pronoun mistake. Now if I look over here, I can double click on this and it's gonna highlight what's throwing that flag. Okay, now I see why it's doing this because om um is a noun and his is a pronoun. If I look at the second mistake, it's the adjacent word. Well, here is a pronominal suffix in Hebrew, and here is an English noun. Now, according to the consistency standards that we wrote for this project, we typically don't allow nouns and pronouns to be linked 
um, between the two languages. And there might be exceptions to this, um, but this is kind of a rule that we can check for and, and look for mistakes. You'll notice, however, that other flags got thrown. Um, an uncommon link checker, which says, hey, these things are not usually matched in this way. Uh, and an improbable link checker that actually is looking at sort of neighboring possibilities and says, hey, it's much more likely that you meant to put um, which means people, with people, and his with this other pronoun. Because throughout the corpus, these relationships are, um, are maintained much more frequently than the one that was presented in this text. If I run the checker again, all of those flags disappear. In addition to this, we have other kinds of checkers that look for um, engrams, so Hebrew phrases that occur together and are commonly translated by uh, the same English phrase, are they matched in the same way? We also have primary status checkers that say, hey, maybe uh, an English uh, group of words is translating a Hebrew verb consistently, but are we consistently giving the same primary status in that group? Now, before I leave you, I want to give you one final view of this tool to show you what it's like for a human aligner who's familiar with it and how fast uh, they can work. So I'm going to come over here to Genesis 16.2 and align a text. And here I'm actually using my finger on the touch screen. You can see that really I can align it about as fast as the computer is able to process what I'm doing. So it's possible to really go pretty fast. And there we go. I hope this has given you a, a great idea of what it's like to use this tool as a human aligner, and in particular to see the ways in which it is possible to produce a text alignment with a very high degree of quality and consistency and not take a long time in doing it. Thanks for watching.